In this video, we'll look at how data can be saved so that it persists within one request response cycle using request attributes. You'll learn how to set request attributes, you'll learn how to get request attributes, and you'll see how long the request attributes persist. To begin, let's review how a client-server web application works. The application starts when a request is received from the client to the server. The web server will then create a request and response object. Using the MVC pattern in Java, we'll use a servlet as a controller, and its responsibility will be to work with the request. It may call upon classes from the model to fulfill its duties. Eventually, the servlet will be done, and it will pass control to the JSP. The JSP's responsibility is to handle the view of our MVC design pattern. As such, it is responsible for creating the response. The request and response objects are available to both the servlet and the JSP. The JSP may call upon the model classes as well to perform its duties. Eventually, the JSP will finish making the response, and it will send the response back to the client. When the response is sent, all the objects from the JSP and the model will be discontinued and no longer functioning. In addition, after the client receives the response, the server will also exterminate the request and response objects. So the server forgets the client is even there to some extent. All of the objects from the first request response cycle are gone. Eventually, the client will send another request and two new request and response objects will be created. And these will be active for this request response cycle. Anything that was saved along with the request and response from the previous request and response cycle are gone. Let's see how we might work with request attributes in our Eclipse application. Here's a simple Eclipse application. This application has three view components. Index.jsp is primarily to get the ball rolling and provides a form where a user can enter a student name, student age, and GPA. When the form is submitted, a request will be sent to the server to run page 2 servlet. With page 2 servlet, we'll first get the data, we'll create a student object, and as we'll talk about in a minute, we'll store that on the request so that it can be used by the JSP. Then we'll move to page 2.jsp for the view of this request response cycle. With page 2, we'll get our value from the request, and we'll display it in a table. Of course, now the original request and response to page 2 servlet are deleted and no longer available. So we'll send another request to page 3. Page 3 servlet will simply pass execution on to page 3 view. So the controller here doesn't do a whole lot, except for tell the view to do its work. In page 3, we're going to check to see if the request data is available. Notice from page 2 to page 3 we did not send along any new data and the data that was displayed on page 2 was in a table instead of a form so it's not passed back to the server. So in page 3 we're going to try to get data from the request. If it works we'll display it in a table but if it doesn't it should have an exception. We'll catch that exception and we'll show a message. So page 3 is designed to show us that the request data only exists within one request response cycle and as any new request response it'll be gone. Let's run that to see it in action and then we'll come back to explore the actual commands used to store data on the request. So we've made one request to our server just to ask for index.jsp. Index.jsp returned this form where we can enter some data. Put in the name Victor. Victor is now 5. Let's say as a GPA of 4.0. When we click Go, a new request will be sent to the server to run page 2 servlet. Page 2 servlet will create a student object and add that to request as an attribute and pass the request on to the view page2.jsp. So when I hit Go, we'll see the response created by page2.jsp and if all works correctly, we should see a table showing this exact data. Here we see that the response was correct and showed us the data. This time when we click the button, a new request will be sent to the server to run page 3 servlet. As we saw, the code in there only passes along execution to page 3.jsp to return a view. Notice that we're not sending any new data. This is just a table, not a form, so data is not added to the request. 
In page 3.jsp, if there is data on the request as an attribute, it will print out another form. But if not, we'll have an error and it will catch it and it will show us an error message here. So let's see what happens. New request, and the final response is request state does not last past the life of the request, which ends when the response is sent. So we see the data that corresponds to the request with the form lasted only as long to receive the response from that request. The next request did not include the data. Let's have a look at the code to see how this was accomplished. Again, index.jsp simply provided the form, so this was the data, student name, student age, and student GPA, that sent along with the request for page 2. This request is received by the page 2 servlet. The first set of instructions you should be familiar with by now gets the data from parameters. Parameters are always string, so we've converted them as necessary to the appropriate data type. The next step in the servlet is to create a student object. Student object is available in the model. We create the student object and we pass it those values in its constructor. Next, this student object would only exist as long as the servlet is working. Once the servlet is done and passes execution onto the JSP, if we do nothing, the student object will be deleted. So, we need to be able to pass the student object along to the JSP. You recall when we dispatch execution onto the JSP, we pass along the request and the response. So conveniently, as the request is already going to the JSP, it has a method that lets us add data to write along with it. And that's the set attribute method. So if we use the set attribute method of the request, we can pass objects to the next component, which in this case is our JSP. It's important that I set objects, okay? I'll discuss that a little bit more in a moment. Two arguments are provided to the set attribute method. First is simply a label. We're telling it what we're going to call this attribute. In this case, we called it the same thing, student. Provide that as a string. Second is the actual value or the object that we're going to put there. This was also called student. Difference here is one is in quotes, the label. The other one is not, meaning that the value or the object is being sent that's called student. Now I mentioned that attributes are objects. That's opposed to parameters, which are strings. Of course, that's a type of object, but it's a specific object. Once an object is saved as an attribute on the request, it is actually stored as a generic Java object. You can see that here in the description of set attribute, where it says the second argument is big O object arg1. You might recall that every Java class extends the Java object class. I like to think of this as compressing the student object down to a generic object size just for transport. Execution will be passed to page 2.jsp when we forward it, so let's see what happens there. Page 2.jsp, we want to get that student object off the request. As we used a set attribute method of the request to put it on the request, it seems obvious that we would use a get attribute method to get it. Notice in this description that when we get it, it's going to return a Java object. Big O object is listed in front of it on this description. We only provide one argument, and that's the label that we used when we created the attribute in the first place. So we're going to get the student object. As it is currently compressed as a generic object, we need to make sure that it expands to the appropriate object type. We're going to do that using something called casting. We cast, we're basically doing a conversion, and we do it by using in parentheses the class name for the object that we want to use. So in this case, we're going to get the student attribute as an object, and then we're going to cast it, or if you will, uncompress it to a student object, and then we're going to store it in a local student object. After that, we can simply refer to that student object and get its values to create the table for display. We saw the table on the client side. We hit a request. Page 3 servlet does nothing but pass execution on to page 3.jsp along with the new request and response object. Page 3, we do the same thing. We try to get the request attribute called student, but we wrap it in a try-catch so that if it does not exist, as it doesn't, 
it should throw an error. When the er error occurs, our catch will be implemented and it will simply add the message as we saw. If there were no error, we would have seen the table. So with this example, we see that request attributes exist only as long as the request object exists within one request response cycle. Let's see it in action one more time and talk through what's going on with the code. I'm going to enter Nicholas 15 go a request will be sent for the page 2. Page 2 servlet will add a student named Nicholas who's age 15 to the request as an attribute then pass execution onto page2.jsp for the view. Page2.jsp will read the attribute and then create a table for us to view and send that back as a response which we see here. When I click page 3 button a new request will be sent. New request and response objects created on the server. No additional data is sent. Execution is passed to page 3.jsp. It will try to read the attribute off the request, but it does not exist. So it will send back an error message telling us that request attributes only exist through one request response cycle. As we see here. In this video, you have learned how to set request attributes using the set attribute method of the request object. You've also learned how to get request attributes using the get attribute method of the request object, and you learned that you needed to cast them back to the object type you need. Finally, you also saw that request attributes persist only as long as one request response cycle. This has been a Piercy production.